following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. And so I know that's something that Yaniv was thinking a lot about, you know, sort of at the inception of the graph is, you know, it wasn't just like, how do we make data publicly available, but like, how do we decide, you know, what data is actually true and deserves to be part of this large global graph? TIQ podcast. Today I'm speaking with Brandon Ramirez, co founder and research and product lead at Edge and Node. In addition to his role at Edge and Node, Brandon is one of the original founders behind the graph. Brandon was incredibly kind with his time, and our interview lasted nearly two and a half hours. So I've decided to split the interview in half and create a two part series. During part two, which we'll release next week, Brandon discusses a lot of interesting ideas including the story behind Edge and Node, a core dev team working at the graph, along with the design of the protocol incentive structure and how the roles of indexer, curator, and delegator emerged. During part one, which you're about to hear, Brandon talks about his corporate experience working at Microsoft, his move into entrepreneurialism, and then he provides a great backstory about the origin and early days of the graph. We started the discussion by talking about Brandon's personal and educational background. Yeah, so I grew up in San Diego and studied electrical engineering at USC. I'd say in terms of my background, I'm kind of a generalist at heart. Even as I get more and more technical, I feel like I've worn a lot of hats over my career. In fact, even in undergrad, I started as a business and computer science double major um, and then ended up switching into electrical engineering because that's where I kind of had more intellectual drive and, and passion. But when, at the start of my career, I didn't work as an electrical engineer. I actually worked as a product manager at Microsoft on some big data products. I worked on Excel, owning features like pivot tables, pivot charts, um, some of the enterprise dashboarding. Um, and I've kind of had this through line of like data products throughout my career. And the big reason, honestly, for switching was just that when I graduated USC in 2010, most of the job opportunities were working for big military contractors, Raytheon, Northrop, Boeing, all the companies that are kind of down there in El Segundo. And I really didn't have a passion for building things that, you know, would end up being sold to the military or could be end up in weapon systems. And so I kind of ended up just getting thrown into software as a matter of, you know, as, as a matter of like finding the, the job that felt like the, the biggest fit for me. And also that put me back at the intersection of business and, and kind of technology, which is where I'd wanted to start, you know, my undergrad studies in the first place. So did that for about five or six years, working as a product manager, learned a lot about how software gets built at kind of the highest levels at these huge companies. You know, when I started my career, it was these long three-year waterfall cycles, right? So we actually ship software on physical disks. And so it was a really different way of building software than we do it today. But nonetheless, you saw the whole process end to end. And after kind of getting a feel for that, I wanted to dip my toes into startups just because it, it felt like great way to kind of test your abilities, have, you know, a more personal relationship with the customer and the user. You know, one of the things that's challenging about working in enterprises, sometimes you feel like you're so far removed from the user and the market. And, uh, and during that time at Microsoft, I'd actually been keeping in good touch with Yaniv, who had been one of my peers and actually project mates back at uh, USC. He had a job in uh, Boise, Idaho, working on uh, doing embedded systems on HP printers. And it just so happened that one of the remote offices that I managed as a product manager was based in Boise, Idaho. So I would do these business trips back and forth to Boise all the time. And even I would grab beers or coffee anytime I was in town. And that was kind of one of the ways that we kept our friendship strong throughout you know, the first couple, two, three years of our careers in enterprise. So you and Yaniv begin working on a startup together at or around this time. What was it that you started working on together? In our first startup together, we were focused on you know, restaurant tech. And 
we learned a, a ton in that process. Many of those lessons that we, you know, applied when starting the graph and importantly also built, you know, our relationship as, as co-founders. So when we started Future Things, we didn't have to work through all those interpersonal, getting to know each other or one another's work style, values, those sorts of things. And that startup, I did the product management as well, but I was also wearing a few other hats. I did most of the UX design. Uh, I also did our the sales. I managed, I grew and managed the sales team. I, I sold our first customers that you know brought dollars in the door. And so, you know, up until those first five six years of my career, really kind of solidly establishing myself as as a generalist and fi- trying to find the commonalities between these disparate fields, right? Um, and that's something that I. I look for a lot in my career, like what are the common threads be- between, you know, different fields that can be applied elsewhere? You know, the ways that like some of my robotics and control systems background from undergrad are like playing into the way that we're thinking about the economic design of protocol. Learned a ton of lessons, like I said, in that first startup, but we eventually did decide to shut it down. You know, it just wasn't on the growth trajectory that, you know, we needed it to be. It was one of the hardest things I, you know, I've done in my career was shutting that down, going back to customers that I had sold, taking the product back out, having had paying customers at the time. And at that point, I kind of wanted to retool a little bit. You know, there were some phases during that first startup where I had sold customers, pre-sold customers, and we were kind of blocked on some of the engineering work. And it was such a bad feeling not being able to kind of roll up your sleeves and like really push, you know, the needle on the engineering velocity and get your hands dirty. And so I spent about a year at that point retooling and getting back into to software engineering, actually, which came from this desire to kind of get closer to the work, closer to the, the tech. I had, didn't have any professional experience at that point working as like an application developer, you know, uh, writing software. I had written software as part of my electrical engineering studies, both doing things like Verilog and like low level C for like embedded systems. You know, Verilog is a language for, um, for basically like designing circuits. So then what did you do next? So yeah, I spent about a year retooling. At that point, I started consulting in the Bay Area, moved from Austin, Texas to San Francisco Bay Area, started consulting for some companies out there. Uh, And then about a year and change into that, I actually rejoined Yanni for a startup that he had been working with Giannis on, a a dev tool startup focused on uh, React developers. And this was in late 2017. This was like mid to late 2017. And a few things happened after I joined. One was kind of coming in with like the product manager mindset. I kind of realized that part of the market opportunity that they had been early on was sort of passing in some ways. You know, when they started working on this project, they would have been the first entrant. But in the meantime, you know, a few other really compelling options came up in that space. So it was kind of, you know, becoming a little bit more of an uphill battle in the market. And the other thing that happened was Ethereum was really coming to prominence. And, and we, we started observing that, you know, every lunchtime with, you know, Yaniv in uh, San Francisco, we used to work out of the Galvanize there. Every single lunchtime, we'd be talking about crypto and like what was becoming possible in crypto and like what was becoming possible with programmable incentives and all the things that were sort of becoming interesting at that time. And we weren't really spending any time talking about the startup that PI and you know Giannis were working on. And that was a good indicator to us that we were probably, you know, probably working on the wrong thing. So we shut that startup down. We decided at that point that Giannis, Ian Eve, and I all, all enjoyed working together. All, at that point, we were all programming, you know, we were all writing code. Um, and so we decided to pivot into a software dev agency, a little boutique agency. We called it Functional Foundry. And we just started looking for clients in the blockchain space. And uh, and fortunately for us, there were a lot of projects in in 2017, you know, that had raised sort of exorbitant amounts in ICOs, and many of them shockingly didn't have technical teams on the on the projects or on the founding teams. And so we would kind of come in as like the the technical expertise to help them build X Y Z app that's built on Ethereum or you know some other blockchain. And it was pretty early days for like you know app development on Ethereum still, and so that kind of put us in this position of being some of the first ones to experience some of the problems as app developers that the graph eventually you know, went on to solve. I think a lot of listeners will be surprised to hear in your background is time at big companies like Microsoft working on a tool like Pivot Tables in Excel, which most listeners and certainly I myself have used quite a bit. What was that experience like working for such a big software company on such an important product? And how has that kind of informed what you do now and how you approach things? I mean, the, the most obvious connect is just that it got me thinking about data in ways that I'd never 
that, you know, appreciated before. Like it, every part of my career since then has really had this through line of like enabling users to do something interesting or useful with data. And like Excel was kind of the start of that for me. Uh, some of the clients I was consulting with later as a software engineer, I was actually working on their analytics platforms. The other thing that I think working at Microsoft really gave me an appreciation for was just scale. You know, just because they have literally hundreds of millions of users using, you know, Microsoft Office, like, even very tiny decisions when you think about the impact that that's going to have on people is absolutely massive. And like that can be from a user experience standpoint, right? Like if you save 100 million users, you know, 15 seconds or a minute on some important flow or, you know, task in their day, like in aggregate, that's actually quite a large impact. And the converse is also true, right? If you, if you don't approach the, the challenge of making that product usable and having like really streamlined flows, the level of care and passion that, that it deserves, like you could actually in aggregate be stealing that amount of time from humanity collectively, which is kind of a, it's a big responsibility. And it, like it definitely weighs heavily in your mind as you're doing these things. The other type of scale that, you know, it comes up in a variety of ways. Another one is energy efficiency. So one of the earliest talks that I got when I was, uh, you know, I just joined Microsoft, it was like part of this like PM orientation. They talked about just the impact of an extra disk read for a certain type of uh, action in the software, right? So a disk read takes a little bit more energy than reading from memory. And you can actually measure that, that delta in energy usage. And then you multiply it times the number of actions the average user takes that action, and then multiply it times the number of users. And the math works out that like even like a few disk reads and you know some key user flow could be an entire coal power plant, you know, somewhere in the world that needs to be built to support that inefficiency that's been introduced into the app. And so just operating at that level of scale was, you know, really incredible. But the the counterside of it is that you're not agile at all. You're you're sort of steering an aircraft carrier, you know, and everything you do is slow. Like I said, there's these three-year release cycles. We had a ton of this was, you know, after um, all of Microsoft's compliance issues in the 90s and the antitrust stuff in the 90s. And so working on any feature, you have a ton of work that's just around compliance and like accessibility and like making sure that these open source office clones can use the same file formats. And even there, the scale comes in, right? So you have a compliance error there. And I think at the time, the fines from the EU, if you were found to be not in compliance, were on the order of like millions of dollars a day for each day that you're not in compliance. And so, yeah, I mean, just the types of concerns that you think about when you're operating at that level of scale are just completely different. So someone with your background and training, I mean, Microsoft's got to be kind of the apex. There's only you know a few other companies that really fit in that realm. And yet you had this entrepreneurial bent in you that pushed and motivated you. How would you explain that passion or interest in being an entrepreneur, having achieved such success? It's one of the most well-known software companies in the world. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in some ways I was kind of late to the entrepreneurship game in the sense that like, I didn't even really know what a tech startup was in its true form. When I graduated college, I had this sort of vague awareness that I wanted to be at the intersection of business and technology. That's why I started my undergrad that way. Part of, I think, why Microsoft hired me as a product manager, despite not having a background uh, as a software engineer. So most PMs, by the way, that get hired at Microsoft have a comp sci background. So it's a, it's a technical role, even though you're kind of in this product management position. And one of the things that they liked about me was that I had a strong sense of like the impact of the engineering work and not just looking at this sort of thing in a vacuum. So I had done some internship work at Cisco where I was actually doing like automation testing for some of their like multicast systems. And, and they really liked that I could hone in on the value that had to key clients and customers in the space. That ability to see the, the impact and the problems being solved for specific users and kind of really empathize with the user is, I think, part of what gave me a leg in the door at Microsoft. But the, the downside of being at a company so large is that, you know, I kind of alluded to this earlier, is you're so many steps removed from the user. And you're also so many steps removed from the impact that your changes and your, um, you know, your specific contributions are having in the market, right? And on top of that, you're, you're kind of, you're in this environment that I refer to as like universal competence, where like everyone around you is so incredibly competent. And then not only that, you're operating within processes that are so well-developed and defined that have been built out over you know, years, if not decades, that it's kind of, in some ways, impossible to mess up. And 
being able to mess up or being able to, being in a position where you can make mistakes, I think is really essential for learning. And so I kind of hit a point where like, you know, I was really feeling like I could do anything and I wouldn't get this like learning feedback cycle. And so I, I didn't feel like I was going to keep growing on the trajectory that I was at that time, even though really enjoyed the, the people I was working with and the impact that I was having working on such a massive and widely used product. I felt like, you know, to really learn, I'd have to get closer to the user and also be able to start something from scratch. And so I could build up those processes and those like organizational learnings, um, you know, myself. Inevitably, someone's going to listen to this interview. They're going to be working at a very large company in a Web2 type environment. You've made the leap. You've done something really remarkable in that leap. What would be your advice to Brandon 10, 15 years ago that was still working at Microsoft and was contemplating making a move that you've successfully made? Hmm. Uh, my first advice would just be to not sweat the small stuff because, you know, things, things, uh, things work out in the long term in ways that are so impossible to predict in the short term. And so especially to someone in your, you know, in your early 20s, like I was like, I think the most important thing is to just follow your curiosity and experiment and try as many things as possible. And it won't always be obvious how those things connect. And, you know, so today in like my work in, in, in crypto, like I'm, you know, leveraging, you know, ways of thinking that connect back to my electrical engineering training, which I never thought I would use professionally. Um, you know, I've had this long through line of kind of interest in economics, took some classes in college. Uh, I used to read, you know, probably several economics books a year for, you know, a huge part of my 20s. Again, never really thought that would sort of end up being like valuable from like a, you know, marketable skills perspective necessarily. But it was just where my curiosity was at the time. And like now I'm thinking about economics and economic design uh, all the time. I think about UX design all the time. I think about product management on data products all the time. My first startup, you know, at the end of it, you know, we had been working on that thing for two to three years. Like I said, we had paying customers. We had, we had been bootstrapping it. So, you know, foregoing like our market rate salaries that we would have been making at these large enterprise customers. And I had a lot of, you know, sort of, I don't know if regret's the right word, but certainly some like existential angst of like, hey, that I just spent two, three years, you know, working on something that uh, is going to just be a step backwards or a kind of a non factor into my future career. And then it's like you fast forward a few years and a strong relationship that I developed as a business partner with Yaniv during those years um, has absolutely carried forward into to future ventures. And then, you know, in many ways, part of what I think has made the graph successful is that we're bas- we've basically made all our mistakes, you know, in the first startup, right? And so all the lessons from that first venture have, you know, also carried forward. And so you know, to get back to your original question, if you're trying to get into crypto, I would say just do it, especially if you're at that phase in your career where you're supposed to be, you know, exploring and experimenting. And if you're later in your career, I would say by this point, you've probably built some skills that are valuable along some domain or some dimension. And despite what many people think, crypto is bigger than just the tech. There's many opportunities to contribute. I think this podcast is a great example. So figure out, you know, where you know, a, a good heuristic for, I think, for any, any type of career move is figuring out like the intersection of where your interests lie, where your skills are, and kind of what the market rewards. And I'd be shocked if for most people that have a, you know, professional career that's spanned, you know, a decade or more, that you wouldn't have some intersection with what's needed in, in, in crypto today. Well, I love the story that you've told so far because it's so much the model of entrepreneurship and people taking risk and taking chances. You've mentioned some of those early failures that you and Yaniv and, and Giannis went through. What are like the one or two lessons that came out of that? <laughs> so there's there's a lot more than one or two lessons. I, I can I can go through a few. I mean, so one one thing that was challenging, and this is an interesting one actually, because it's a rule that we broke with the graph. But one thing that was challenging about our first startup, which like I said, was in restaurant tech, was that we actually had a lot more users than we realized at the outset. You know, so we had this product that was used in the restaurant. It was like a real-time customer feedback product. And then it was we were pivoting that into, into payments at the table. And so if you look at the users that needed to be engaged and like engaged in certain behaviors for the product to work well, we had the guests at the restaurant. We had the servers uh, at the restaurant. We had the GMs who needed to actually like respond to and take action on the feedback um, or look at the dashboards that we were building. Um, and then in larger restaurants, oftentimes there, there was like a fourth stakeholder, which was just the owner themselves, who was the person we were trying to sell. And so 
So building a product, um, especially when you're bootstrapping and you have a really, really small scrappy team, building a product well for that many different user personas at once, especially when they're interacting with different applications all together that are connected to the same system is really, really challenging. Um, we did break that rule with the graph, but we, we came up with a sequencing that would make that manageable. You know, so when we started off building graph node, uh, you know, as an open source library and then the hosted service, we were just entirely focused on the subgraph developer really for, you know, one to two years before we introduced the complexity of having to bring in the indexer, the delegators, the curators. Um, and by that point in the life cycle of the startup, we had a lot more, you know, resources. Our team was bigger. So it was easier to kind of give each of those areas the attention they deserve. But that's still an area we're trying to get better, by the way, is, you know, making sure we're giving each user persona kind of a full product manager, set of software developers, designers, you know, basically a complete feature team because each area really is, um, is quite deep. That's one lesson. Another lesson that I think, you know, I really came away with from the first startup with is it's really important to understand what your basis for competition is in, in the market that you're, you know, trying to compete in. Right. So as a technologist and as and, you know, many entrepreneurs that have a you know, s- software or some kind of engineering background, we tend to have a bias towards technical solutions to any problem. Right. You know, to a to a hammer, everything looks like a nail and not everyone thinks that way. So to give you an example, um, if you were to present a restaurateur or like a restaurant owner with the problem their bias is towards a human oriented solution. So you say, Hey, you have this problem and their, their instinct is, Oh, I don't need to buy a piece of software to fix this. I actually need to hire a person to fix this. And just the fact that they don't have that same understanding as you at the outset means that your barrier to selling them to get this product deployed is that much higher. And the other thing is, you know, so another example, you know, related to that, that came up with, you know, this first startup was, um, understanding like the role of distribution, that would be another one. So, like in many cases, we would talk to potential clients or you know restaurateurs where they actively despised the technology that they were using and wanted to switch, but they had such a large vendor lock-in or upfront cost, you know, with their installation, or they were working with like a you know channel partner that had kind of brought in this whole solution of technologies, and they didn't want to go outside, you know, the channel partner, and so. The fact that there were so many customers not even making their choices on the basis of the quality of the technology is something that, you know, that we didn't anticipate and was something that, you know, was a really hard lesson for us. A lot of this stuff you can, you know, you can learn in books. Like one that I recommend to a lot of upcoming entrepreneurs is Steve Blank's The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And that was a largely influential book for, you know, Eric Reese's The Lean Startup. In my experience, many entrepreneurs need to learn these lessons for themselves even after they've read it. But, you know, a really key observation from both of those books is that there's more things to validate than just, hey, does the user have a problem, right? That's where many entrepreneurs start. But really, you need to understand a sequence of things that you would need to validate is, you know, does the user or does the target user have a problem? Does the target user know that they have a problem? Do you have a solution to that user's problem? Do they agree that you have a solution to that user's problem? Are they willing to pay for that solution to your problem? And do you have a sustainable way to get that solution in front of enough users, you know, where the the economics of selling that user are actually, you know, sustainable? And and that was, you know, that last part is was one where this first startup fell down where the unit economics of each customer after you account for the amount of time it took to sell one of these customers, you know, we were targeting SMB restaurants, you know, the math really didn't work out. And the amount of churn that uh, restaurants have with respect to their employees meant that even after a sale was closed, we were spending you know hours and hours going back in and retraining the new staff anytime they had a new GM, a new set of servers. And so even though we had correctly identified a problem that they had and they admitted that they had, and, and as well as a solution that you know many of those you know restaurateurs agreed would address their problem. There were kind of more steps of validation that, you know, that ended up being sort of the linchpins and and that business not working. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, dApps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at thegraph.foundation.com.
That's the Craft Talk Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ. Thank you for listening to this podcast and for supporting this project, especially those of you who have taken the time to leave a review, rate the podcast, or share an episode on social media. The GRTIQ podcast shines a light on the people working to build the graph, and each week we get to meet a new member of the graph community to hear their story, to get a fresh perspective, and hopefully to learn something new. But the truth about the graph is that it's really about the countless stories happening every single day all across the world, including your story, that will make the difference in the success and evolution of the graph, and ultimately, Web3. You get to write your own story, so if you have the ambition to help build the graph, then take initiative and get involved. Join the graph's Discord, start reading and contributing to posts in the graph's forum, join the graph's Telegram and Reddit channels, and look for ways to make a contribution. They're out there. If I can do it, so can you. Thank you for your support. Welcome back. When I hear your story, and I hear all the details of how you got to where you are today, I see these different threads, and I'm wondering if you know if you've ever made this connection, and, and maybe I'm overstepping, but you know, you talk about your days at Microsoft and kind of seeing and understanding data for the first time, and that being a thread through your life. Then you talk about some of the economics books you've read and understanding incentives, and then you talk about this experience you had in your first business where you had to understand different personas and different uses and kind of consider the ecosystem. I mean, as I hear all this, it seems like it snowballs and inevitably leads to something like the graph. Is that a too much of a stretch there? No, I, I, don't, I don't think it is. I mean, it, you know, so the, one of my favorite podcasters is this guy, uh, Sam Harris. And he basically has this kind of thing that he's talked about that like, you know, you need to find your category, you know, to compete in. And it's not that you need to be the best in, you know, when we when we grow up, we were raised to kind of think in terms of these very sort of predefined categories, right? We have these subjects in school. It's like you have math, you have science, you have English, you have history, and then you, you know we're kind of thrown to university, and then those categories expand a little bit more. But like we're essentially taught, okay, you need to come up with some you know category that you're gonna you know that's gonna be your major and your track, and like you need to be the best in, in that category. And they're very cookie cutter kind of categories. And then when you get into the real world. You know, the skills and experience that you build are so much messier and they intersect in really unforeseen and interesting ways. And so, like, when I was working as a software engineer later in my career, you know, I was building applications with React, with GraphQL. Uh, I was kind of using the whole modern web stack throughout my entire career. I had this economics through line um, as well as this kind of UX design behavioral economics through line. Um, I had this systems design, you know, background from electrical engineering. And so those things intersected really well for me with the graph. Um, And I think what most people, especially as you get to the the end of this kind of exploration phase of your career, where you try a lot of different things, you can find these intersections that are really just unique to you, right? And and that's kind of the way to, to create differentiated value. And in a lot of fields, you know, it's kind of well understood that advancements in that field come from outside the field, right? Uh, you know, some of the latest thinking or research in economics uh, taking place at places like the Santa Fe Institute came from them bringing physicists into the room, right? And applying like, hey, what, you know, what lessons can we apply to economics from, you know, maybe the types of models that you guys have developed over here? And um, so, yeah, so part of what I love working on the graph is that I feel like it integrates all my various interests and experiences in a way that, you know, makes me uniquely, uniquely suited to work on some of these problems. So going back in time a little bit, then you mentioned that you and Yaniv, and I believe you said Giannis would meet for lunch and some of the conversations started trending towards crypto and the possibilities in that space. And I'm just curious at that point in your life, what were those possibilities? What were you talking about at lunch that seemed like opportunity? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was early days back then. And, and just to, to clarify, yeah, Giannis was still based in Germany back then. So it would mostly be Yaniv and I uh, at lunch in San Francisco. And 
I think a lot of what you know caught people's imaginations early on was a just what can you do with this new primitive of programmable money? And I think we were seeing some of the early like experiments in that space early on with respect to you know ICOs. You were seeing prediction markets be talked about. Um, you were seeing these crowd sales. Like I, th- I remember one idea we talked about was just like the fact that you could have crowd sales where the thing that was being sold was the right to use that platform in the future. You know, and you could imagine really that being applied to anything. Imagine satellite internet, right? So you could use tokens as a way of getting capital formation to put all these satellites in space. And then those same tokens would entitle you to the future usage of that internet uh, bandwidth, right? And so like those types of ideas, I think were flourishing. I, but I think it was still really, really early, you know, when it came to some of the the other ideas around the decentralized web and like, you know, what are the, the promises of decentralization? I think a lot of the narratives in those early days were around censorship resistance and kind of like this uh, regulatory, like, you know, no man's land that blockchains, people hoped blockchains would be. And I think over time, I think we've matured to kind of understand that Web3, you know, the decentralized internet in particular just has this unique set of value propositions beyond, you know, was well understood, you know, kind of in those early days. Um, and that was actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention this earlier. Like I first heard about Bitcoin in 2013 at the start of this startup in, in Austin. And for me, it was the, the right message, but the wrong messengers, you know, and it was these, uh, these two kind of anarchist types, techno anarchists that were really interested in like Bitcoin's ability to, as they hoped, you know, kind of subvert governments and nation states. And, you know, I thought it was it was an interesting idea, but it didn't speak to, I think, the the value of the types of applications and systems that we're that we're trying to work on now. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And it sounds like you've thought about this, but there is an ethos, there is an ideology behind Web3, behind a lot of the things the graph is pursuing. And so how would you then characterize it? Because like you said, in the crypto space, there's a lot of different ideologies, right? And some of them can be really to the right and some can be really to the left. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of facets to this. I think the the TLDR is really, I think Web3 is about unlocking human progress. And I think there's a number of dimensions in which it does that. So I think that the more obvious narrative that gets talked about a lot these days is kind of the, you know, the one around the ownership economy, the idea that Web3 creates an internet that in some ways fulfills the original vision, you know, where users own their data users own their identity. They can take those things with them. So they have this sort of unprecedented level of choice, you know, and competition when it comes to choosing the applications that best serve their needs, uh, as well as leveraging their data in ways that wouldn't be possible when it was trapped in these kind of data monopolies or data silos. In addition, users own the platforms themselves, right? So you either have these platforms, you know, like Ethereum that have sort of this implicit ownership where the user can hard fork at any time or choose to, you know, Ethereum had its hard fork, right? Where many users chose to stay on Ethereum Classic and some choose to move to Ethereum. Or you have platforms where the user explicitly owns the network because they were participating in some kind of on-chain governance, right? So I think if you knew nothing else about Web3, just even understanding the fact that Web3 is an internet where users are in control, I think that would be enough, right? But I think zooming out a little bit, I think there's some other long-term narratives that I think are important to understand. One of them is that Web3 turns every application into a platform. And this is a cycle that kind of plays out naturally over time, you know, where technology sort of many technological innovations, they start off as applications and then they become platforms. And what I mean when I say an application is that, you know, something that delivers value to a set of end users, whereas a platform is something that can freely be built upon by businesses and other applications that then go on to deliver some value to end users. So, you know, one example historically of this is the railroads. You know, the railroads had this huge boom in the U.S. in the 1800s over this, you know, 50 to 100 year cycle towards the latter end of that as that sort of deployment of railroads reached maturity. Uh, you saw a lot of anti-competitive behavior where you were seeing railroads basically collude to set prices and basically act like an oligopoly. That was actually at the heart of some of the, the first antitrust regulations and policies that were set in the U.S. was actually to 
kind of target some of these railroad uh, oligopolies and cartels. Now, fast forward a few decades, um, those railroads ended up being essential infrastructure to the mass production and automobile you know, revolutions, right? You know, so Henry Ford had these factories in uh, Michigan, Detroit, um, that were integrated into these railroad lines. And imagine, you know, what the alternative history if the railroads were still run and controlled by cartels. But the important thing is that that played out over a long period of time. We're seeing something similar with with the smartphone app stores right now, right? Like the iPhone's been around since like, I think around 2008, 2009. Um, phones obviously much longer, and for most of that period, they've had an uncontested monopoly or oligopoly, if you include Android, on you know app store sales. You don't see competitive pricing at all when it comes to the percent of sales that the platforms take from app developers. Right, it's been at like thirty percent, I think, literally for you know over a decade, uh, maybe two decades at this point, which is kind of a sign that there's not competitive forces driving that thing down, as you would expect in the free market. And only now, decades later, are we starting to see some policy action that's targeting these app stores. We're seeing some large high-profile lawsuits. We're seeing Apple relax some of their restrictions on on the app store a little bit. But again, this is a process that has played out over decades. Now, you fast forward to crypto and you look at a project like Uniswap. Initially started off as an AMM, presumably targeting you know basically an on-chain exchange using a, an automated market maker, presumably targeting end users so that um, those end users could have a better experience when trading tokens and access to more liquidity. And then after these initial wave of uh, AMMs, you started seeing these DEX aggregators, you know things like One Inch Exchange, for example. And the time it took for Uniswap to become an application targeted at end users to becoming a platform that other applications could build on took less than one year. So it's kind of in the DNA of applications that are built on on blockchain and on the decentralized protocols that they have all the properties of a platform from day one. And it's really just up to the innovation of developers to decide, okay, how is this thing going to be combined and remixed and interconnected with either other existing building blocks or new ones that I create? And, and that, I think, is a very fundamental shift in the way that technological revolutions develop. And I, I would expect that to see an acceleration you know, in new technologies, new applications, new platforms that wasn't possible in the era when platforms were locked down by centralized companies or monopolies. So as you and Yaniv have this dialogue and you discuss the potential of crypto in what probably sounds like the very early days conceptually of what Web3 could mean for the world, at some point you come up with this idea about the graph. And I'm wondering if you can just take us back in time to what those early aha moments were when discussing the graph. So you need to have the original idea for the graph. Um, so some stuff that was, I think, relevant at that time is GraphQL was really changing the way that applications got built You know, in traditional web apps in ways that if you're kind of outside the space or sort of subtle and maybe underappreciated. But GraphQL, among other things, gave companies and enterprises a way to, behind a single API, represent all the data in their organization and have it be queried in a way that was efficient and flexible, which was a large departure from uh, the way that enterprises used to be managed where you would have these various REST API endpoints that were sort of rigid. They only returned like a certain set of data. They weren't collected behind a single endpoint. There would be like disparate like microservices in the background, each with their own you know, endpoints often, and made it really hard to think about like what was the universe of data that existed behind some application or enterprise or organization. And once you start working with GraphQL and you start seeing how easy it is to express this kind of large interconnected data domain, the sort of obvious thing that comes as the next step is like, well, you know, really, if you think about the data in the larger internet, it also has these conceptual, this conceptual interconnectedness, right? Like that's not the way that we architect things because of the sort of legacy primacy of the SQL database and like the API servers that that we used to build around them. But like, a user in GitHub is not different than a user in Twitter or a user in Facebook. Like they're essentially conceptually, you can think of them as a as a single entity. 
an account, you know, for example, in one application might have relationships to a user's um, activities and some other application, right? So the way that, you know, traditionally the web has been architected because we didn't have the, the infrastructure that would allow you to use data itself as an interoperability layer is that we would create these silos, right? So you'd have to have your SQL database, which is very dangerous to let anyone access directly. Then you build these API servers around them that have things like access control and they sort of map these REST endpoints to, you know, the, the sort of schema of the database. And then when you want to do this kind of connectivity and integration of data, you have to do it at the API layer. So you've had entire cottage industries like Zapier, Unito, um, emerge that are, are basically bubble gumming and paper clipping these sort of like closed APIs to one another. And when you integrate things in that fashion, you're not really, you're not really using the data itself as the interoperability layer. You're, you're really just creating these copies, right? You're, you're passing data back and forth to try and synchronize the data between, you know, a user in GitHub's database versus a user in Facebook's database or a user in Twitter's database. But they're fundamentally copies that, that are not, um, uh, that are not synchronizable uh, at a fundamental level. So that's kind of one larger trend that was happening, which is rethinking the way that we represent data. Uh, actually, for uh, listeners that are interested, I wrote a blog post really early on on this called GraphQL Will Power the Decentralized Web, where I kind of go through in like more detail like a lot of the, the things that make GraphQL uniquely qualified to, to sort of be the API endpoint for, for decentralized apps. Um, the other thing that was kind of happening was, you know, Yaniv and I had this experience, you know, with this first startup. I didn't mention this, but like one of the big pain points that we were trying to address for restaurants at that time was negative feedback on Yelp or inaccurate data on Yelp or other, you know, kind of review platforms. And so there was this kind of, uh, you know, there was this question of like, what is the sort of verifiable public data with respect to some entity, right? Like a restaurant or some other business or a place or a location, right? We didn't have the systems and the tools in place then to kind of agree on what the true state of these public data sets were. And so I know that's something that Yaniv was thinking a lot about, you know, sort of at the inception of the graph is, you know, wasn't just like, how do we make data publicly available, but like, how do we decide, you know, what data is actually true and deserves to be part of this large global graph? That's an area where I, I think the that that latter part is an area where I think the you know the crypto space as a whole still has a lot of work to do. I know there have been some projects kind of geared towards deciding what is true. You know whether it's prediction markets, whether it's using oracles, whether it's trying to create um, you know reputation systems uh, with domain experts. Today, the graph primarily addresses the issue of indexing and querying that public data. Um, but once those protocols become more developed, you can imagine the graph actually being a global open API of, of true data, right? It could represent some, some kind of, you know, global consensus on, on, on the data that's being queried. Now, it doesn't have to, right? But that's, those are the tools, you know, that are available to, to anyone building on the graph and building on, building on these emerging, you know, crypto protocols. So that was kind of, you know, where the initial vision started was this idea of a global graph of verifiable public data. And, you know, I think Yaniv had the first spark of this probably in like the summer of 2017. He was also, you know, reading a lot of white papers around uh, decentralized databases at the time and also trying to think through, okay, what would the application stack look like for fully decentralized applications? The thing that we were missing was kind of a strategy, right? So like a vision is kind of where you want to end up and a strategy is sort of like the, the route you take to get there. You know, and I kind of mentioned this earlier in interview some of the lessons we learned on the first startup around kind of what are the sequence of things that you need to verify to to get from uh, A to Z. And it wasn't until we pivoted our team into consulting in the blockchain space that we started experiencing some of the problems that decentralized application developers would go on to, to experience. You know, so just how difficult it was to uh, index data from the blockchain um, for a whole bunch of technical reasons that we can get into uh, and put them in a database where, you know, they can be queried easily to drive some kind of application. That was a problem that we were witnessing our clients spend tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to try and address. And so that was some like really early validation that, hey, there might be a problem here that's worth solving. And 
it's through finding that, like, we obviously could have solved that in many ways, right? We could have, we could have, uh, uh, started a SaaS company, right? That like that would have been a, a completely viable business model once you you identify a problem that users are willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars on. Um, and that's where the vision comes in, right? You know, our vision was that we wanted to create this global graph, you know, verifiable public data. We wanted to bring to to life the promise of the decentralized web, um, and those things would only be possible if we we sought to solve that problem as a as a protocol. So. In about December and like January, February of 2017 slash 2018, we started working on a, a demo. Um, so uh, Yaniv and Yana started hacking on like a, a demo app built in Go. And I started doing the research for how this would work in a decentralized context as a protocol. And I, I wrote the white paper. And that was kind of the first thing that we showed the early supporters of the graph when we were looking for financial backing to, to work on this problem. Founder and Graph Council member at the Graph, as well as research and product lead at Edge and Node. If my conversation with the GRT IQ podcast has been helpful to you, then please consider supporting future episodes by becoming a subscriber. Visit grtiq.com slash podcast for more information. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening. Are you saying that a lot of the early thinking and ideas related to the graph came from these observations about APIs and a, a, the global treatment of data and access to it, along with some of your consulting and identifying there's a problem in the blockchain space on this very issue? Yeah, I think that's a good way to sum it up. You know, we had this vision of how we wanted to change the world. We saw what you know crypto was enabling in terms of like putting users more in control of their data and identities. And we saw solving this problem as a way of building a platform that would enable that. And we saw it as important for it to be decentralized. And that's one of the, that's one of the things that I actually think makes the graph unique when you compare it to some other protocols is that, you know, really there might be an alternate history here where someone else came along and identified this problem sooner and, and started it as a SaaS product. And that product could have gotten mainstream adoption and huge network effects and traction. and People might not have stopped to think like, well, what if we had solved this in a, in a decentralized way, right? Like a lot of the, the projects that you're seeing today are sort of, you know, especially when you're looking at like blockchain projects, like layer ones, layer twos, state channels, like there's no centralized analog, really. You know, it's like the blockchain was like so fundamentally new. It's not like anyone's going to go use AWS Lambda instead of Ethereum, right? Whereas, you know, from, from day one with the graph, like we... We had this vision of where we want to end up, but we really also approached things from a product, you know, product manager's mindset, honestly, just because we knew that there was a risk that this could be solved in a centralized way. And it would, there weren't enough good examples yet of what building on a decentralized stack looked like that we thought we could afford to lose this, this layer in the stack to, to centralization. It sounds like one of the early decisions you made then kind of tied to the idea you just shared was solving and addressing this problem and creating a protocol that to do it. Was that an early strategic decision and kind of what went into deciding to create that protocol? And I guess maybe as a setup, can you explain why that is a strategic important decision for listeners that aren't even familiar, why that might even matter? Sure. Yeah. So I guess I'll take it. I guess I'll answer the second question first. So why is it important for the graph to be decentralized? Um, it really kind of comes back to some of the value of Web3 stuff that we were, were talking about before. But the, the classic playbook, uh, Chris Dixon has a really great blog post on this called Why Decentralization Matters. I'm sure a bunch of your audience has read this already. Um, but he talks about like the classic SaaS data monopoly playbook. And really, you see this with a lot of applications where in the early days, you're creating value for users. And then in the latter days, you're extracting value from users. And so you kind of get this like S curve, right? Of like from value creation to like value extraction. And this has kind of been the playbook for most uh, successful tech companies for the last two decades, right? You know, whether it was social media apps that started with no ads, uh, you know, for the first few years and then build up these giant ad businesses on top of users' data in the latter years. 
or SaaS products that um, basically you know lose money on acquiring a customer in year one, but then because they have this data monopoly, they can kind of extract and and you know make money off them in perpetuity for you know, the, the later years. It's really the, it's, it's the playbook, and so understanding how important the data that was going to be queried through the graph was, the idea that it would be built in such a way that the economic incentive five, 10 years down the road would be to extract was kind of unconscionable to us, right? And, and by the way, like, I don't think these companies are, that are extracting are, are necessarily doing anything evil. I mean, like, it's the way that the current system is, is set up, right? Like they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders to make as much profit as they can from the assets that are available to them, right? It's like, it's the, uh, you know, there's an expression, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Like the, their incentive is to do this. And so that's why it's so important when you're building one of these things from scratch, like you need to have the right set of incentives from day one, you know, to avoid that kind of outcome in the future. And I, and I think, you know, we felt that, you know, decentralized protocols had that right set of incentives. Um, and then from a personal perspective, like, you know, one thing we didn't touch on on the, the, the validation story earlier was we talked about a lot of user centric things that you needed to validate or market centric things. There's also personal validation, right? There's this idea of founder market fit or founder idea fit. So like for us, we just wouldn't have felt personally motivated to work on this problem unless we could do it in a way that we felt aligned with our values. And, uh, and so even if there was a successful business to be had, you know, running this as a SaaS company, we just didn't want to be a part of it. It would have been hard to show up to work every day to do that. And I think it also would have been hard to recruit some of the world-class talent that we have now, both at Edge and Node and in the larger graph open source ecosystem, you know, if we didn't have that, if we didn't have that strong values alignment. Uh, and then one thing I'll add is that not only did this ideologically align us with uh, you know, our own values. It, it also ideologically aligned us with many of the early users of the graph who themselves were decentralized applications. So, you know, they were building as dApps for a reason. And, you know, even though the graph from day one, you know, it was just an open source library, there wasn't a protocol or a network yet, like because they knew that's the long-term trajectory of the graph and because, you know, that the teams and the, the developers had been organized in such a way that would lead in that direction. Um, I think they they took a big bet on us, you know, in a way that they they may not have if we were if we were a SaaS company. Um, and some of our earliest supporters, you know, financial backers for the project were actually notable decentralized applications that went on to be the early users of the graph. So that that kind of was a part of our early product validation, but also just shows the degree to which other developers in the space really wanted this to exist in a decentralized way. This concludes part one of our two-part series featuring Brandon Ramirez. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, when Brandon talks about Edge and Node and the design and thinking behind the protocol incentive structure and the emergence of stakeholder roles, such as indexers, curators, and delegators. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-E-I-Q Podcast. Podcast. Roger that.